Thrones. Let's do it. All right, started. In a world. <laughs> I have to, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, that'd be cool. <laughs> if we actually had the other part of the, the, the introduction. <laughs> uh, so here, I've got some notes uh, that I've revisited. These are uh, ideas and principles that I've... Uh, I've, I've learned years ago, but, like, there's a difference between, like, learning, knowing, and, you know, un- understanding a thing. And so, for the last couple of years, uh, I've gone through this very passive regimen of observing all of these things, and how they, uh, how they dwell and shape uh, the universe in and around us, and I mean, luckily, uh, they're they're out there to explore. Uh, it's just you gotta have the right lens to uh, uh, fixate the validity of the the teaching to uh, to every area of life and their uh, their hermetic principles. But um, you know. I don't really like where it comes from or where people think it comes from. Uh, there's, it gets its name from, uh, Hermes, uh, Trismegistus, the thrice great. And I don't, I don't really dig that for the sheer sake of like, well, you know, what's so great about that in the first place? Who set that standard? Yeah, it's very, very potent and valid information, but, uh, there's a little bit of bias on that behalf, so I try not to subscribe to the the bias behind the intention, but the uh, intention behind the teaching, and that to me has proven to be more than valid. Um, if anybody's read like the Kabbalion and uh, all these like super double secret ancient texts that are readily available online. Uh, it's, it's there, you know, and a lot of the principles that are present there, all in one place, um, they predate most of the organized theology that pervades the planet now. So you see... Or you see a, uh, a religion... Repeat that last part. What of it is valid? Repeat that last part. Yeah, uh, it's you, like the internet cable up. Yeah, it's. I think it's mine. Uh, the these principles uh, can be found all in one place if you're looking in the right place, but you can see them in everything. Most. Religions and theologies take and kind of pick and choose and uh, write over them, and you're really forced to read and reread these stories, these uh, these myths and legends of holy men that really do everything but address it directly. And with that, you know, we're just like, well. Gosh, I you must know so much. I revere you as a deity, but at the end of the day, you know, it's there to be had, not just kind of written over or anything. I think that's kind of where uh, we get a little confused. But, I mean, this is the natural law of things. The, uh, the fabric and the material that kind of weaves in and out of our existence and uh, stabilizes and uh, makes it kind of make sense to me. And like I said, I've uh, like I learned this a long time ago, but I didn't understand it. It took it took me a couple of years of observing to really uh, solidify the potency that this carries. And uh, revisiting it in the hindsight of knowing, um, it's like 
great, I can write these things down very simply, and I don't feel like there's a person I can't explain this to. So, the time, time well spent there. Uh, I think, I think it's very basic, but at the same time, all encompassing. So, if you'd like, I'd like to go over them. And I'd love to hear what you have to, uh, g- yes, feedback. That's always very good. It's always a very fruitful conversation when, uh, two self-similar comprehensions are in play. So, uh, like I said, some of it is like, oh, well, I, yes, of course, that only makes sense. But together, it's so simple. Uh, so, these are the hermetic principles by, uh, the universe, by Spencer. Um, so the first natural law there is, uh, it's kind of just that first defining step is the law of mentalism, being that everything is in the mind, um, it's, it's fractured through a mental state. It doesn't matter, like, if I'm eating an orange or, uh, slaying a lamb. It all processes through the mind, through this, this electrical storm happening, playing out my, my brains. Uh, the thought is what always forms first. And then physicality follows. So, you know, something I mean, it's only as solid as you're going to perceive it. It doesn't mean, like, I can't just put my hand through a fucking wall or something. Um, but it does mean recognizing it by the recognition it's in our mind. That being said, uh, our thoughts create our existence, truly. Um, if, you, if you change your thoughts, you can change the quality of your experience. So if you are so hell-bent on seeing, you know, the negative side of things, uh, you could be handed, like, a trunk full of gold, or you could just be handed this, like, ripe opportunity, but the mind has m- melded itself to to accept something different. And so we'll, we'll be handed this pot of gold, and we'll be like, oh, maybe it was stolen, or... You know, you, you question this this opportunity, and you break it down till it's nothing, till all you have is a box of lead. Uh, so if you if you change your thoughts, you change the quality of your experience, and if you want something different, then you have to do something different. You have to think differently, approach it from another perspective. Uh, and that really is, I mean, that's the first law: is that everything is mind. Uh, they say we are the universe experiencing uh, itself through this uh, human perspective, but I mean, ultimately, we have this massive universe inside of us. So, uh, you know, we, we only perceive it through the mind. Uh, even emotions of the heart have to filter through the mind at some point. Uh, so, that kind of leads me into uh, the second law, the natural law, and that's correspondence. This is one that's kind of been a little bit more widely popularized in this uh, newest age movement. And that is what is above, so below, and what is below as above. Um, This all-encompassing macrocosm outside of us, this totality, reflects equally the infinitesimally small microcosm, the the individual units. I'm s- something that you you know and you're well versed in is that this reality is holographic in its own nature, and you break down the word holographic, you you uh, see the root hol holistic hologram, and that being stated, I'll give you an example. Uh, if you have like a bunch of Lego building blocks, all different materials, you know, you build this uh, wonderful house. You can take them apart, and it's like, okay, the, the, there are these individual units, but they're all kind of a little different. However, with a hologram, something that's holographic, uh, like let's say we have a uh, like a cube, like being projected 
through light. And to us, it's solid. However, it's, it's just a uh, vibration of light. Now, if you split a little piece of that cube, you still have the exact same material. Uh, it's unwavering, uh, but it's the same as the whole. So the whole holistic, the holographic, the hologram. Uh, so to understand a piece, uh, to understand the, the macrocosm, the stars and the universe, the things outside of us, you must understand the microcosm. And to understand the microcosm, you you first must realize that it's all, yes, whatever, it's connected, but it is infinitely mirroring itself. Uh, we see we see these self-similar things. Uh, the Fibonacci sequence, for example, and the golden ratio, they go hand in hand. You know, the, um, the joints in my fingers and the bones in my hand correspond to the way a sunflower blooms and the way a tree branches out and the way a river flows and uh, just the rate at which we walk and breathe. Everything has this beautiful mathematic correspondence in People will be like, oh, that's a very cold way of thinking about it and measuring the universe, but it is that other side of the coin. There's nothing not beautiful about it. It's just another way of looking at it. Uh, so the universe is inherently fractal. Uh, it is self-similar across all spectrums, uh, which leads us to the third natural uh, law, and that's that's vibration. Again, this is another. Uh, it's it's becoming more popular with all these, uh, you know, publications and people coming out and saying, "Hey, man, I dig your vibe." Uh, you know, it's it's become this relevant thing again. Uh, it's always been relevant, but it states that there is nothing truly at rest. I mean, on the surface, something may seem completely solid. But when you really break it down, when you really look into it, there is motion, there is vibration, there is no non-motion. And, and the state of rest, like we perceive death, is just this ridiculous concept that's a cop-out. Um, there's always more. There always is more. Nothing is completely at rest. Matter cannot be created or destroyed, it just transmutes. Um, all of this existence is vibration. Solidity is an illusion of vibratory differential. So when you take something like light, sound, uh, matter, antimatter, it's just different rates of vibration. People are so uh, fixated like, ooh, pick up, uh, pick up this quartz or pick up this ball of lead. You feel, you feel that right there? Well, yeah, okay, whatever. It's vibration, man. Uh, us, we are just kind of like light condensed to a certain vibration as uh, well as sound and everything that seems so terribly solid. We're all moving. We're all going somewhere. We're, we're, we have this innate ability to not not move. So uh, just any any of all of this, everything that passes through the mind, it's it's all vibrating. Even even the mind has this potent vibration. So even like thoughts, thoughts have forms, and thoughts form first, so that has a certain vibration. Uh, you take negativity and all of that, and it feels a certain way. And you know, you're around a person, and you're just like, I can't explain it, man, but I get really weird vibes from this guy. It's not to be explained. It just is self-explanatory. Um, but on the on the topic of like, ooh, good vibes, bad vibes, and uh, good and evil, whatever, man. Uh, the fourth, the fourth law, the fourth principle is polarity. So you have everything that I've talked about so far. Everything has this dual nature. The mind, uh, in which everything passes through, perceives everything within a uh, duality of the spectrum. Uh, for instance, we have, uh, you know, left and right hemispheres of the brain. Uh, we have these radical concepts of, like, good, evil, and uh, a coin, for God's sakes. A coin has a heads and a tail. And, uh, 
You know, every everything's kind of divided amongst itself. So my thing is, you know, these are all kind of just things that we perceive through the mind, uh, that everything is opposite to a degree. But my what I pressure people to consider is what is the difference between good and evil and heads and tails or a Republican and a Democrat, you know? And if you if you take the example of temperature, we have the, uh, the idea of uh, hot and cold. Like, ooh, you know, while well, I'm warm, ooh, I'm cold. But can you point to me on a thermometer with a, with a pen or mark a line and say, this is the defining moment at which hot becomes cold. You know, my, like, okay, I'll, I'll draw the line at 60 degrees, but somebody comes along and is like, well, bro, I'm from Minnesota, and you're out of your mind. So it's all, I mean, it's all different perspectives of uh, polarity. But, like, you have you have heat, and then you have the absence of heat. It's not hot and cold. It's one thing, and it's, it's the presence of one thing, and then the lack of presence. So it's this... Uh, it's this long spectrum. So everything is identical in nature, but different in degree. So I like, I like saying this because it's, it's true. All conflicting differentials have at some level, they, they have this ability to be reconciled. And yes, that includes a paradox. This thing that, uh, is so, uh, self damning and like really, you know, messes with our heads. But that's, that's just, it's beautiful. Like, you can reconcile a paradox on some level. Everything can be reconciled. So, you, like, for example, the unified field theory. That's a little bit out there of a concept, but so is a freaking paradox. I don't know if I'm allowed to swear. So, every, okay, a paradox is so, so out there, but so is the unified field theory. Saying that, you know, all things are one thing. And that everything is a part of one whole organism. So even a paradox at that level can be reconciled. Uh, the fifth, the fifth principle is, uh, rhythm. And that, uh, all things have an outward and an inward. Uh, there is this natural flow to things. Uh, you know, for example, uh, like it, it's it's in layers, you know. We've got waves and tides, and so like with the influx of a tide, you also have waves rolling in and out. And with the outflux of a tide, you still have waves rolling in and out. So it just goes to show you that there is this fractal nature to existence. Now, like everything has a rise and a fall, a crest and a trough. So like a pendulum swing resonates in everything and at the end of the day this is you know it's like oh wow these are such rigid concepts but they're mostly just tendencies truly you know existing most certainly but if you want to if you want to overcome these these tendencies of the universe it requires like so much energy and for example if you have a man who's determined to uh, get away from shore, this man is going to have a hell of a hell of a time rowing out to see if the tide's coming in. It's working against him as he's trying to, trying to move. But if he's smart, he knows the tides have this ebb and flow, so he decides to go out on the ocean when the tide is going out. So instead of expelling so much force, he's using the natural flow of the earth to get him where he wants to go. And like I said, it, it can be overcome. It just requires a hell of a lot of energy and uh, attention to these things. If, if you wanted to go with the go with the tide, you can do that. That's the smart thing to do. It's the easy route. But if you were hell bent on breaking this rule, you can do it. It just you're going to be tired after rowing. You know, and on the proverbial waves coming in. So, um, that being said, with the, um, with me saying, you know, there's just, there are just tendencies that can be overcome. There is this underlying cause and effect 
which is the sixth principle, cause and effect. Every cause has an effect, and every effect has a cause. So if you're going to row out to sea with the tide coming in, the result of that is that you're going to be exhausted, and you're not going to get as far as you want to go. But if you use the tide, you're going to get a lot farther on a lot less energy. So um, everything has a cause and effect, and that truly is one of the most rigid things that I've talked about so far, and that's because it's just, it's the law of things. Uh, um, chance, as we as we know it, this, this randomness of life, is only a name given to a law that's not been recognized yet. So, there are, like, so many planes of causation, you know, in, uh, in uh, lighting, uh, lighting a fire, cause and effect. Or uh, voting for president, cause and effect. It uh, everything has its just result. So this this is like one of the most basic laws. And you know, yes, there is free will. Most certainly, there is free will. We we really can do anything we want. We can we can uh, row out to sea with the tide coming in. But with cause and effect, if you break one of these natural laws, which very possible. There's free will, yes, but none that can ignore the law without consequence. So, yeah, like I said, you can break a natural law, but not without suffering some sort of, uh, some repercussion. And, uh, some people think, you know, oh, you know, karma can be instant or karma takes too long. It just, it depends on what's, like, set up. In, in, in karma's way, if we, if we are to understand this. And this kind of delves into the fact that, oh, cause and effect, yeah, karma, you know, we see that in tons of theology and stuff, but it's never, like, properly defined. Uh, you know, everybody tries to work their way around it, but there really is no escaping this. Very, very basic. Uh, A, B, you know, you do A, B happens. And, uh, because of, uh, B, you know, another A has to come about, and it just forever and ever, and Amen. But um, if you think about somebody uh, sitting in the middle of a ring of dominoes with dominoes on both sides and uh, it just goes all the way around, yeah, you can knock over dominoes and sit and wonder and wait, but eventually it comes back around and hits you. Uh, it just depends on, just depends on what's there. Uh, the seventh natural law, and I think one of, uh, one of the more unexplored regions of, uh, the governing format of existence is the, uh, principle of gender. Uh, everything has a masculine and feminine. They, they manifest on all planes. And we here, in this reality, in this point in time, this wavelength, this vibration, bro, we are only seeing the physicality manifest. Um, you know, it does. It manifests on this plane. You know, uh, you know, everybody has their corresponding physical gender. Everybody's born with uh, certain bits, as it were. But it's unexplored, in part because you have all of these people that are just like. I feel like I need to have tits, but I don't have boobs, and, you know, they, they just, they fancy a certain person, and you just, with the way life and course, everything that corresponds to this life right now is set up, you know, it's been, it's been demonized and all these things, and I'm not saying, like, go out and sleep with whatever rock you want to, but, like, for God's sakes, uh, there, there is this massive diversity. And, you know, that plays directly into the law of polarity. Uh, the good and the evil, the one or the other, the masculine, the feminine. But like I said, it's just how we perceive it. It's just this huge spectrum. They're all points on this endless spectrum of perspective. So I think with the, um, with this exploration of, <sighs> I'm gonna hate myself for saying this, but like, Caitlyn Jenner, this, this person, who has not only the resources, but the potency to make this statement. Uh, it's, um, it's starting the conversation, you know, as opposed to just like, 
you know, male and female bathrooms. It's like they're all the same fucking toilet, man. You know, we had unisex bathrooms in our house forever. You know, I've got tons of roommates who are who are girls, and we all use the same restroom. So we I, there's this weird like block set in the way right now that we see it's one thing or the other thing and I think with that in play we're coming to realize like you know uh, maybe maybe not so rigid bro chill so uh, gender manifests on this plane as uh, the genitalia but uh, masculinity this potent uh, this, this set of being it's logical, it's analytical, and there's all these, like, linear thoughts. So, you know, a, a masculine thought uh, is point A, point B, straight line. And, you know, get to point A. Quickest, quickest way to get from point A to point B is a straight line. Now, that's very, very left brain. That's the male side of the brain, the logical side. Uh, the one that equates all of these equations and makes all of this world try and make sense, tries to bend it. And um, I think we've just really forced the bending. Uh, so it's a little it's a little rough right now. But the feminine on the opposite side of the coin is that creativity, the, uh, the compassion, and the, the holistic thoughts. It really is um, it really is a holistic world. And so uh, we are just struggling with masculinity in a feminine world you know we all come from feminine energy that's where we come from but we've kind of had all the stuff set up and like i said it's one of the least um one of the least explored principles i think um before i get to the um to the last one uh i want to explain that you know, the seven principles, uh, you know, they can be found in a lot of books, but there is this force behind all of it. Um, some people would say, oh, it's God, or something else. We, we've always struggled with it. We don't know what the hell to call it. And if you think of the principles as pillars in a room, you know, okay, the fabric of existence is what it's all holding up and defining and securing. But pillars don't float. There has to be foundation to this thing. This, you know, we, we, we've lost sight of the, the ground that we tread. And, you know, because of that, you ask any, uh, any man, woman, or child, you know, what comes first? What comes first in your life? And most people will say, oh, uh, God comes first, or my family comes first, or oh, I have to work, or just something along those lines. But a principle is the first thing. Number one, man, and people have been living without principle for the longest time. Uh, like people will pick and choose their different principles from theologies all around the planet and say, hey, I've got a pretty good grasp on this. But until that truly is placed first, you know, we're, we're just kind of digging underground looking for treasure when it is, in fact, the ground we stand on now. And so uh, we call the eighth principle the lost principle. Ooh, 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 ooh. And it's not so much lost as it has been forgotten or overlooked. And we, um, as a species, I think... Like, right now is the crucial time to, like, pick this up and really adhere to this thing, the foundation first. Um, I save it for last because I think it's probably the most important thing. Um, and some people would say, you know, oh, love, love defines all this stuff. And, you know, we've really bastardized that term, man. And so uh, it's care that makes this make sense. Not, not compassion, because compassion is just... The mind and the heart going, hey, this thing has to resonate somehow. But care, truly care, caring, the, the act of doing, the, the process of what it takes to do something. If you want to take action, you first have to feel it. 
in your heart. It starts in the heart. The heart is the first thing that forms when we're when our cells are dividing. It's the very first chamber, the first thing that's detectable when a child is conceived is the heartbeat. That's the first thing they look for. And so the heart being the first thing, that's where it starts. We have to feel something. But it can't just like sit there because then, you know, that's, oh, that's passion, you know, that's anger and uh, that's just a feeling. That's just something festering in your chest, in your soul even. But after that, like, you have to think about it. You've got to think about what you're feeling. And if we can't truly define it, we're, we're stuck there, you know, but between our head and our heart. And that's, that's compassion. That's, that's the, that's the being trapped between the head and the heart. And it's not a, it's not a bad thing. For God's sakes, if your gears are turning, just keep them turning. But then, like, from your heart, you have to feel, and then it has to go to your head. Because if you don't think about what you're feeling, then you just kind of lash out and uh, lust in a certain direction, whether it's uh, learning or uh, loving. It, if there's no direction, then there is no way. So after that, you have to you have to know enough to act on something, you have to feel enough to think enough to act enough. So it goes from your heart to your head to your gut, and you act with our gut. You have these three centers of the body that operate as furnaces almost, where uh, vibration, bioelectricity circulate, most certainly. And so if you're stuck feeling something, not thinking about it, you'll never be able to act. And if you're just acting blindly, then you're never going to feel what it is you're doing, especially if you're not thinking about it. So that to me is the most fundamental thing is that like alchemical process in the body of turning uh, this uh, feeling of lead to to this end product of acting and that's that's gold man truly that's gold uh, and so I feel that's kind of what we're missing right now is just this ability to care to give a fuck and I mean, there, there are so many things. There's this uh, mass amount of masculine energy that's kind of dammed up the flow. And we're not seeing that natural pattern occur. But, I mean, it's happening, but it's happening slower. Um, we're on this downward slope. So if we could just recognize that, yes, it's there's this flow to life then we can ride the wave. If we if we understand the momentum we gain as we go down, however far down this this wave takes us, we can ride it up into this femininity, this this reemergence of creative energy. And like you you see um you see this wave throughout history, throughout the things that shaped our civilization. So, you know, you have the um the very, very intense, uh, like the, the Inquisition, that's a very masculine mind thing, you know. I'm going to torture you until you tell me what I want to hear. And, you know, that's that's A and B. Uh, people tried to make an art of it, but it's still, it's very A, B. It's a means to achieve an end. No in-between, but what little there is. And so, after that I really could be stupid about this I could be wrong but whatever as an example like a feminine point in our history this this turning point of uh, theology and philosophy you look at places like Greece and like the the emergence of the Renaissance where all of these feelings were mapped out and said you know, hey this has some validity too so it's it's there and it's there to be acknowledged once you acknowledge and learn, you know, all you have to do from there is understand. So you you acknowledge with your heart, you explain it with your mind, and then once you have that process figured out, however fucking long it takes you, uh, like your your mission in life could be to just make that woman on the corner 
in downtown wherever, a person you've never met smile and go about her day a little differently. And you could have struggled with everything in your life up to that point just for that. And you, you die. You get hit by a car. Well, that's it, man. Like, all of this process has happened. But until you act, nothing really moves forward. So you have um, this uh, – you see these three things kind of manifest in people, and they, some people kind of get stuck there. You've got, like, uh, people like uh, Stephen Hawking. Good God, Stephen Hawking. Why is that so hard to remember? Uh, the speak and spell. That is Stephen Hawking. Uh, you know, he, when you think of that, he's like, oh, that's a very smart man. Well, that's about, that's about all there is to that. You know, we think of him, we don't think of him as going out and protesting a certain thing or just like, you know, being this abundantly, this abundantly flowing fountain of love. We think about what he's contributed intellectually because that's where he is on this, this journey. That wherever, you know, wherever the hell he is, that's where he is. He specialized himself in the head. Uh, you have people that just uh, feel so much. And that's kind of where a lot of people are right now. Where we all feel that something's kind of wrong, but there's a lot happening and we can't quite wrap our heads around it. So we're stuck in this, like, oh, God, give me some freaking antidepressants. Because this is all so terrible. So, I mean, like, Gandhi... Just, I'm giving, like, really crude examples. If you can think of any other ones, like, please share. But, like, Gandhi was, like, very heart-centered. Uh, and, you know, he... Everybody has, like, something wrong with them. But, you know, everybody is, like, perfect to their own degree. Everybody has their own field of expertise to bring to the table. But, like, Gandhi was, like, really heart-centered. Uh, you know, that's where everybody kind of knows him from. It's his... Uh, the way he made people feel and think about things. So, uh, I'm trying to think of who, like, would just be, uh, okay, so, like, somebody who just kind of comes from their gut would be, uh, like Donald Trump. Somebody who just, like, opens their mouth and it's like, and this dude's about to be the president, you know? I mean, there's, there's a chance, there's a chance, I'm not saying anything, uh, but, you know, he's just action, action, action. You know, let's build a wall. Let's do this thing. And, you know, yeah, whatever. It resonates with people. It's because people are stuck in their gut, you know, just, just acting, acting, acting without really feeling or thinking. There are hints of it in all things, but, you know, everybody kind of has their own way of going about things. And the process of going from your heart to your head to your gut, it's this perfect organic way of going about this existence at least from at least from where i'm coming from i really don't claim or pretend to be an authority on anything i just know that like everybody has something to bring to the table you know whether it's the equivalent of peas carrots the table uh or like a whole roast or a fork you know everything is kind of essential to enjoying a proper meal and you know i think it's just i think it's about time we we ate our fucking peas, man. There it is, I said my piece.